Whenever anyone says, I'm going to KK, the first question is always, are you climbing Mount Kinabalu? And after multiple trips to Saba, this is the first time I can reply, yes, I'm doing it. So here we are heading from Kudakinabalu to Timbahon, the foothill of Mount Kinabalu. As we travel from one point to another, we're all making mental notes and ticking off everything we've done one by one. And it's a very triumphant feeling to take a look at your list and see that you have only one challenge left. All right, so uh, we've made it to where we're going to be starting off now. You can see everybody sort of gathering. These are all the climbers that are going to be uh, ascending the mountain. And uh, they look pretty fit, which is quite discerning, but uh, I'm sure we'll make it. Now, they're very safety conscious. Yeah. They take all our names down, make sure they know exactly who's on the mountain, who's coming down, who's going up, um, just so they can count of everyone and make sure they're safe. In the year 2000, Kinabalu National Park was designated as Malaysia's first World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Supin's going to be our guide. You can tell he's a guide because he's wearing flip-flops. <laughs> okay. It's going to be easy for him. Now, <clears throat> this is the last time that we're going to be using uh, mechanical transport because from now on, it's all about these babies, it's all about the legs. Cousin Gio bought me all my clothes. Ready to roll? Let's go. Just before we started the hike, my producer said, this is going to be easy. You've already conquered Tahan. Ah, famous last words, my man. Now this is Timpurn Gate. It is the gateway to the whole of Mount Kinabalu. It holds at about 1,866 meters. So it's kind of, uh, it's a step up. It's a, it's a helping hand because we've got 4,095 meters to climb. So uh, it's perfect weather for it. It's not too humid, it's not too hot. Uh, hopefully the rain will hold out and it's gonna be a fantastic climb. Every mountain has its own laws of superstitions and beliefs. Some believe you shouldn't make too much noise, or point your torchlight up in the trees, or even say certain words. And a lot of the times, their reasonings are said to be related to the supernatural. For in the past, locals believed that Mount Kinabalu was a resting place for the spirits of the dead, so the mountain has been treated as a sacred place. I've only climbed half a kilometer and uh, already it's tasking because of the altitude the oxygen is a lot thinner out here so you'll find that your breathing is going to be harder um, shallower as well because there's you just need to your body just wants all that oxygen but it can't get it so you just have to take your own pace uh, take your time and uh, just don't wear yourself out too early As we trudged along, automatically my brain would start comparing it to Mount Tahan. And oddly enough, as tough as Tahan was, for some reason this path was more daunting. It felt dry and lonesome and dreary. I couldn't tell if it was weather related or trail related, or if it was just simply all in my head. So we've got another five kilometers until we reach Laban Rata, where our uh, guest house is going to be. That's where we're going to be resting. Can't wait for that, but uh, another 5k to go. We would take two days to complete this, and we're already feeling drained. The first person to conquer Kinabalu was Sir Hugh Lowe in 1851, and he took two weeks. Imagine not having any steps and just making your own way up. And that's hardcore persistence, man. When you're like really tired, when you're doing all these sort of activities, you actually crave the stupidest thing. I know I've got two eggs, boiled eggs, right up in my backpack. I can't wait to get to the next stop because I'm just going to demolish them straight down the gullet. Come on, man. To the beat. To the beat. To the beat. To the beat. Damn. 
I should mention that there are two trails you can choose from. Ours is from Timpahon, and the other would be Mercy Lao. We wanted a shortcut, and the Mercy Lao path is roughly two kilometers longer. Although it is also said to be more scenic, with more wilderness and much more mossy forests. It's very Lord of the Rings-ish, until you might even expect a little hobbit to jump out at you. But if you want the best of both worlds, take the Timpon Trail up and the Mercy Lao Trail down. Now, that last bit that we just did, super, super steep. I mean, they've got lovely, lovely footing here, all sort of like man-made steps. So it's, it's, it's easy in a sense that it's doable, but are you physically fit enough? That's the thing. And um, it's actually putting us to the test because, oh, this lack of oxygen is really sort of, it's kind of suffocating you. But uh, you definitely feel the burn. The beat, to the beat. <laughs> and then the pressure got to me and I farted. <laughs> oh my God, that smells so bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had a horrible dinner last night. <laughs> it's he's paying for it. Oh, don't walk behind me, by the way. <laughs> oh my god. Long hikes, there are two movies that play in my head. One is 127 Hours with James Franco, and the other is a documentary film called Touching the Void. Both portray disastrous mountain climbing experiences. One hacks off his own arm with a penknife, the other falls down on an ice cliff and smashes his tibia right into his knee joint. Badly injured and without rations, these people still push through for days and survive. Doesn't that make you wonder how you would react in such a situation? <laughs> a multitude of nationalities, we've got the Japanese, we've got English, a couple of Germans down there. Everybody wants to come to Sabah and climb this mountain and that's what we're here for, to do exactly that. Those people must be almost double my age and yet they're all jolly and nimble. It baffles me. I'd probably be lazing about in my rocking chair watching telly at their age. Maybe they got a can of Popeye spinnies that I didn't know about, because all I got was this crummy little bit of bread and this little Humpty Dumpty poor looking thing called an egg. Lunchtime with my cracked egg. I gotta drop a bag. I'm gonna eat it like that, I guess. Whenever you're feeling unappreciative of your food back home, go climb a mountain. It helps you not to take things for granted. Everything tastes exceedingly yummy up here. Mm. Egg and cheese. So I've had my lunch. Uh, we're going to get back on the track because uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover before um, we reach our little campsite sort of uh, place that we're going to stay for the night. It's getting a lot colder the higher we get, so I've actually put on an extra layer, and that's what you got to do. You got to keep layering and layering. You definitely don't want to be getting cold because um, when you stop, you, your, your body kind of cools down, and you don't realize how cold you're getting. And uh, it's very hard. It's easy to get ill, um, and you definitely don't want that altitude sickness. I must constantly remind myself to look on the bright side of life and appreciate everything I'm seeing. It's actually a beautiful rainforest. You've got these lovely ferns, nice and high. You can see there's little birds there. And along on our left here, these beautiful purple little, they look like orchids. I think they might be orchids. Man, it's actually super, super nice. You can see all that cloud there. Very mystical. Did you guys start this morning? Yeah. Yes. Whoa, you guys are spinning. Where are you guys from, Nepal? Yes. Ah. Yeah. Oh, good looking guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Where is he? And they're coming down, we're not even halfway yet. They're literally sprinting up this mountain. Come on, man. <laughs> Do it. Remaining lighthearted and motivating each other works like fuel for the engine. It is really easy to get disheartened if not for friends who encourage us from time to time. And look at these porters. Carrying a gas tank on level ground will be a challenge enough, but they're practically skipping up the mountain like gazelles. 
No idea. I need to go that way. To La Bangrata. Two kilometers. It's all turned to rocks. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that at the back of the one ring in Nome, there's the south peak of Mount Kinabalu? And the south peak is also known as the false peak because the highest peak is ironically called Lowe's Peak. And it's named Lowe's Peak because of Sir Hugh Lowe, the first conqueror of Kinabalu. Wow, now that's a bit of a confusing mouthful. So we've come to a little stop here because uh, me and my producer Kyrie have, uh, have both acknowledged that we have a little bit of dizziness sort of towards us and uh, we actually, there was a group that passed us and one guy being carried down in a stretcher. Now that's serious stuff. Now this, this mountain doesn't joke around so if you do feel like you need a little rest, take it. There ain't no rush getting to the top as long as you make it with one piece. You don't have to be carried down. By this point, or this height, might I say, all the fun was sucked out of us. And by fun, I meant oxygen. We couldn't breathe properly. I felt like my respiratory system was just closing up. And that is one heck of a scary feeling. But once we took a breather and popped a paracetamol or two, we were ready to continue the climb. And when we looked up, we actually managed to see the peak of Kinabalu from that point. So that was a real energy booster. But all this excitement doesn't last very long, so you have to make full use of the moment you feel driven. You Up here in the midst in the cloudy forest, the plantations are dripping with moisture and there's abundance of flora like orchids and conifers. And it was a heavenly sight to behold for sure. But the cherry on top was when I saw a signboard that said we were only 500 meters away from Labanrata. Labanrata wasn't the peak, but I can imagine that the joy I felt upon reaching this point could possibly challenge the amount of joy that I'll be feeling tomorrow. And I was absolutely famished, so I gobbled down an absolute horse load and headed straight for my room. Now today's trekking was just a starter of what to expect from Mount Kinabalu because uh, we've been trekking for about six hours. Uh, because of the altitude, you know, your, your body sort of wears a lot faster and you find yourself tiring out a lot quicker. And uh, we hit the buffet table straight away. We were so hungry. It was such a hard trek for us. It's 7 o'clock right now and uh, I'm actually about to head to bed because we have to wake up tomorrow at 1.30 a.m. I don't think I've ever woken up so early in my life, but we're expected to, uh, to hit the track um, at 2.30 and start the sort of the ascent up to uh, the top. So uh, right now, I'm gonna get some sleep because 1.30, that's a killer. Whew. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Very early morning it is. 1.30 a.m. in the morning, that is. We're gonna climb up to the peak. We're gonna do, how many hours of hiking? Three? Four. Huh? Four hours of hiking. <laughs> Um, catch the sunrise and uh, I'm tired, I'm really tired, but it's meant to be worth it, so uh, it's an experience. <laughs> Such early call times are an abomination, it's so hard to feel excited when you're woken up this early. So this is it, we're on our final little leg of our journey and that's to the peak of Mount KK. Now it's about, well they say we're going to reach at about 5 o'clock in the morning, um, just before sunrise, which is the perfect timing. Uh, all we have to worry about is that the air up there is very thin, so uh, every 50 meters or so we're going to be stopping, we're going to be knackered, we'll be fighting for that oxygen. Um, but uh, slow and easy wins the race as they say, so uh, I'll see you at sunrise. Coming up those steps have been absolutely knackering just because of that lack of oxygen. So we've got to keep going. There was a big group, so it felt a little less lonely. Also, when there are a lot of inexperienced yet capable climbers around you, you'll feel challenged to be just as good or even better. Our terrain's completely changed right now. Uh, we've come up across most of the foliage down below, but it's all going to be a rocky outcrop. 
Um, it's slippery, they've warned us. So there's actually guide rope. Um, we've got probably about another hour and a half climbing. We'll reach the summit. If anyone's head torch runs out of battery at this point, that is not going to be fun at all. And I'm so thankful for my boots. They are the best for rocky terrain. Sturdy hiking shoes are a definite good investment. You have no idea how much it affects your ability to climb. As you can see, these ropes are your lifesaver. This wall is almost vertical, and you definitely need a sure footing because if you tumble, you're going down. You ain't gonna survive it. Uh, there we have it. We're at 3,653 meters, seven kilometers up the trail. So that makes us right here. Let's say it, say it. We've got another one and a half kilometers. Check that out from Timberhorn all the way through all the seven Ks. Yeah. I need a little bit to go. Now, I've got to say, this climb is absolutely breathtaking. Not only because it's physically tiring, but the view is second to none. This is absolutely amazing. Now that we've cleared all the, all the trees, the whole of Sabah is in view, and it's looking mighty fine, that's for sure. My heat is pumping. My mind is chanting motivational mantras. My legs are slugging along. My gosh, I was getting really frustrated and tired. We have half a kilometer left. We're on that last trail. There's so much food there. Absolutely freezing. Lots of people stopping there. That's good. It gives me time to breathe. Uh, why do we do this? I have no idea. Even though you're not enjoying this right now, you better keep walking because other people are ambling along just fine. So stop feeling weak. There's no such thing as everyone's a winner because if you don't make it to the top, you know you're going to be kicking yourself in the shins forever. Yeah, that's exactly the kind of motivational speech I was giving myself. There we have it. We made it to the peak. 4,095 meters. The highest point in the whole of Malaysia, including the peninsula. We did Gunung Khan, we managed to do Mount Kaken. And we have an amazing view It's like a lunar landscape. The clouds have rolled in. The distance. The sun is just coming up over there in the east. Oh my gosh. So, just a little sit down and enjoy the view. The most unbelievable sights are those that are natural. When you're face to face with the results of unrushed beauty, nothing, and I mean nothing else, comes close. Mount Kinabalu's existence in itself is a strange phenomenon because it arose in isolation without the dynamics that apply to other high mountains which usually rely on deep ocean trenches, colliding continents, or thermal lava activity. So we made it. It is quarter past six in the morning. It is a brand new day. And I'll tell you, that was tough. We thought, yeah, we did Gunung Tahan, no problem, whatever. KK is gonna be a breeze. Absolutely not. There was a lot of breeze. It was so windy down there. It was so cold as well, I'm glad. I was wearing some really warm clothes. But I've got to just ask the question, like, why do people do this? Why do they endure so much pain and suffering to get to a place like this? Well, this is the answer. The answer is life. And life is just so beautiful at times. You just got to be prepared to toughen out. The feeling of being above everything else is incredible. You feel engulfed in freedom because you're liberated from all the clutches of your daily routines. You feel so much pride because you didn't give up even though you wanted to almost every step of the way. I felt so thankful for sight and sound and every other overwhelming emotion that I was feeling. Some things really can't be described with words.
Sir George Lee Mallory was an English mountaineer who attempted to climb Mount Everest in the 1920s. Whether or not he succeeded is left to speculation, but here's what he had to say. What we get from adventure is just sheer joy. And joy is, after all, the end of life. We do not live to eat and make money. We eat and make money to be able to enjoy life. That is what life means and what life is for. Life's good. <laughs> Every second is a defining moment of who you're becoming. So with every day that comes to an end, may you have been pleased with it. It's okay if you haven't found what you're meant to do. Most of us are still searching anyway. But be it triumph or be it tragedy, only you can decide what happens next. Life gives you nothing unless you take it. And I say you should just grab it by the horns.